Oh, there it is. OK. And can you see the screen? Yes. Uh, OK, so this is kind of going to go in order too. Um, so starting with chapter one, chapter one was all the directions. Um, if you don't know the directions by now, I'm sure most of you do, but there might be a few like um, yesterday. I noticed horizontal transverse. Um, you kind of we kind of need to um, study on those, but you've got your anterior, posterior, lateral and medial. Um, sagittal, mid sagittal. Somebody frontal, um, horizontal or transverse. So just is that's pretty straightforward. Um, there's really not a lot. You should know those terms. Um, hopefully you already do, but if not, I would study up on them. Um, posterior toward the back. Medial is toward the midline. So when you're looking at medial, I think so where we were getting a little confused yesterday. You can look at medial of a specific object, but when you're talking about like anatomy and science, most of the time you're looking at medial as a whole. Um, so like when I was talking about the mandible, we're talking when they say lateral and medial, they're talking about like the mandible in place not just hand holding it in your hand, even though the, the surfaces would be the same even if you held it in your hand. But um, most of the time, just like with your patients, when you're um, talking left and right, you're gonna be talking about the patients left and right. So with anatomy or when you're talking terminology with a patient, you're gonna be talking about their midline, their the lateral side of their face, the medial side of their face, um, so you're going to be talking more about the body as a whole and not a separate structure. If you're talking about like the lateral side of the tongue, you're going to be talking about the tongue in the mouth. Does that make sense? Then we've got your planes. So if you were to section thing, you've got the sagittal plane, the mid sagittal frontal horizontal, transverse, so horizontal or transverse is going this way, like the horizon, um, and then frontal or coronal, it means the same thing, so they could use those interchangeably. It seems like most of the time, if you're reading an article or something, um, a science article, they're gonna use cor coronal, not frontal. Um, they'll use transverse rather than horizontal. Um, those are just basic, more scientific terms. Then we have the skull. So we need to know the cranial bones of the skull. Um, I would get like use your study guides just to kind of read through them. Um, we're gonna go over this, these bones when we look at the skulls on Wednesday next week, but you've got the frontal bone, the parietal bones, the temporal bones. Um, you've got your occipital bone, uh, mandible, maxilla, Ethmoid and sphenoid are on the inside. The sphenoid one's the one that's shaped like a butterfly. It has the lesser wing that sits on top of the greater wing. The greater wing is bigger. Your nasal bones, your lacrimal bones are inside your eye area. Oh, zygomatic is your cheekbone. Where the zygomatic bone and the temporal bone meet is your zygomatic arch or your cheekbone. Um, you the regions of your head. I'm sure you all know the regions of your head by now, but the frontal region, parietal regions, regions, occipital, um, temporal, the orbital, the nasal, the infraorbital, the zygomatic and buccal, and then the oral region, which is our most important region. And this is what they look like. You've also got your mental region down here, which is your chin. And then these are just some more parts of your face. Um, these right here are the ones we just talked about. And then we've got areas or regions of the neck. We didn't really study the regions of the neck all that closely. Um, we just had said that we have the sternocleidomastoid muscle that runs down right here and it divides the neck into the anterior and posterior cervical triangles. So 
So taking the regions apart, your frontal region, you have your supraorbital ridge, which is right up here above your eyes. And within your supraorbital ridge is your supraorbital notch or foramen, and you can feel that with your hands if you want to feel up there. Your glabella is right, this area right between your eyes, and your frontal eminence is the kind of the um, area that sticks out. If you rub your finger across your forehead lightly, you can feel that eminence or the area that kind of rounds outward a little bit. And you've got your facial bones. This is a picture of all of your facial bones, which we just talked about most of them. In your parietal and your occipital region, there's it's really pretty uneventful. Um, just know that it's usually covered with hair. Um, your parietal are the two bones up at the top and your occipital is the one around the back or the base of your skull, known as the base of your skull. Um, where your parietal bones and your frontal bone meet, there's a little kind of triangular area. As you mature, that area, those sutures will close together completely. But when you're an infant, that area is kind of hollowed out. And that's why you have that soft spot on the top of a baby's head that you have to be very careful of because the bones have not fully sutured together. And so there's that little open kind of hole there. Your external ear is in your temporal region. Anybody have any questions? I thought I heard somebody went. Your external ear is in your temporal region. So it's called your oracle, or basically that's your ear. Anytime you see the word oracle as part of a, a term, a question or a term, oracle is going to be the ear. And usually it's going to have a descriptor. Um, they'll use the word auricular, which means the same thing. It's a it's the ear area, so you might have posterior auricular or anterior auricular. Anytime you hear auricle or auricular, it's going to be the ear area. And the external acoustic meatus is the little hole that's inside your ear that leads to the inside of your skull. So also um, your temporal region of the head that is located on the sides includes the temporal and infratemporal fossa. So the temporal fossa is kind of a fan-shaped area of the temporal bone. It sits right about here and it's where your temporalis muscle sits, right in the fossa. The infratemporal fossa, so think of the word infra, is, is inside and slightly below the temporal fossa which contains um, some veins and arteries and nerves. And then you've got superior and inferior to the zygomatic. Oh, that's where it is, superior and inferior to the zygomatic arch. And so you can kind of see on this picture here, here's the infratemporal fossa. It's deep to the temporal fossa, which is up here. It's below and inside, so it kind of sits below and inside. So if you were to like sort of travel inside your ear, it would be back in there. The orbital region <clears throat> is the area around your eye. So if you see anything that says orbit, it's going to be the eye region. Um, supra or superior, infra or inferior is going to tell you the direction, but it'll say orbital, so you know it's around the eye. So like right here is your supraorbital notch. So supra being above the orbit. Here's the orbit. Um, here's your infraorbital foramen, so it would be infra would be below the orbit. And then within the eye, it's a very or orbit, it's a very complicated structure. It's got a lot of bones that meet to form the eyes. Um, your zygomatic bone forms the lateral border or the outer border. And then the medial or medi um, inner border of the orbit is formed by several smaller bones. So you've got your lacrimal bone and you've got your ethmoid bone. So these are just tiny bones um, that meet to form the inner part of the eye or the orbit area. 
you've got the sphenoid bone, which is kind of the um, posterior portion. And then the frontal bone would make up the top part. So you've got your lateral, you've got your inferior border, you've got your superior border, your medial border is made up of a few bones, and then your posterior is the sphenoid bone. So does this seem any easier now than it did when we were learning it back in chapter three? Because you've heard it like a lot of times now and kind of studied it more. It's more review. Good. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> Didn't mean to do that. OK. Then we've got the nasal region. So anything that says nasal is going to be the nose area. So um, the nose is kind of um, has a few different things to remember. Um, the glabella is the area between your eyes. And right below it is the nasion. So the nasion <clears throat> is actually like the surface area that covers the where the nasal bones meet the frontal bone. So it's the midpoint area where the two nasal bones, remember the nasal bones are two separate little bones that sit up on top here. So if you were looking at your um, anatomy of the nasal region or what you actually see on the surface. Um, you can see underneath there's the nasal bones right here, but then you've got cartilage below it. That's why when you look at the skulls, they don't have a nose. They just have the two nasal bones that kind of project outward, but they don't have an actual rest of the nose. So the nose is cartilage, so you've got your all your cartilage down here. Your ala are these little wings or the outer parts of your nose right here. And then you've got the apex of the nose that you that wiggles or moves. <clears throat> so your next regions are your infraorbital, your zygomatic and your buccal regions. So infraorbital is right here. And remember, you've got your infraorbital foramen right in that infraorbital area. Zygomatic is over here where the bones are, the zygomatic bones. And then down here are your buccal regions. So um, your buccal regions are your cheeks. They're kind of squishy, soft. Your zygomatic are where the zygomatic arch is. Infraorbital, think of where your infraorbital foramen is, or infra meaning below the orbit. So it's going to be the area below the orbit. So right down here. And this is just a picture of all those different regions that we talked about. This is the picture out of your textbook. Then we've got on the oral region, we've got your lips and then your oral cavity is the opening to your mouth and you've got your palate up at the top, your tongue, the floor of your mouth is that area underneath your tongue and then part of your throat is considered part of your oral region. Um, the floor of your mouth is kind of that horseshoe shape where your the base of your tongue sits here and then it, so it goes all the way back um, so if you move your tongue, it goes all the way to the back. That's considered the floor of your mouth. That horseshoe shape or semicircle um, is an area that you're going to talk a lot about in pathology where it's you're more prone to um, oral cancers under the tongue. That's why we retract the tongue and look on both sides as far back as we can because we're looking for lesions, particularly on your patients that smoke or have been smokers in the past or use tobacco. The chin area is called the mental region. So just this area right here. Anytime you um, hear the word mental, think of the chin area. So if we were talking about submental, it would be underneath the chin area, sub being below. 
regions of the neck, we have the sternocleidomastoid area or muscle, um, abbreviated as SCM in a lot of things. So you might see that just as an abbreviation on things. It's the big strap-like muscle that runs down the side of the neck. It divides the neck into anterior cervical triangle right here and posterior cervical triangle. Um, <clears throat> and then we've got your thyroid cartilage and your hyoid bone. So your hyoid bone is that little horseshoe shaped bone that sits right in the neck. It's not attached to or doesn't articulate with any other bones. So it's kind of a unique bone. And here's a lateral view of a person. Um, so they just added some of these regions in and the regions of the neck. Um, they've added like a submandibular triangle. We don't really um, call it that or we haven't really studied that, but if you think about it, submandibular would be sub would be below the mandibular area. So it'd be right underneath the neck here. Um, they also have the carotid triangle, which would be where the carotid pulse would be, right in here. Um, they call the sternocleidomastoid a region. So just they just kind of subdivided it a little bit more just to give you a little bit more direction. So now we're going to look at the skull. So we have the anterior view of the skull. The anterior view would be the front if you're looking straight on at somebody. Um, when you look at straight on at your skull, you're going to see certain bones. You're not going to see all of your bones, but you will see most of your facial bones. Um, as far as seeing the the bones of the skull, you're, you'll see um, all of these listed, your frontal. You'll see the ethmoid bone through both the nose and the eye area. The ethmoid bone sits more in the center of the skull. The vomer, which is right in the nasal area. Can't point to it very well. The sphenoid bone, of course, is inside as well. It's the butterfly shaped one. The mandible. And then you've got your lacrimal bones, which are going to be right in the corners. Um, your nasal bones right on top of the nose area. The inferior nasal concha, which is inside your um, nasal aperture, which is the hole of your nose. Um, and then you've got your zygomatic, which are these right here, and your maxillary bones or your maxilla. And this is a picture of them on the anterior view as well. Cranial bones, you have cranial bones and you have facial bones. So eight cranial bones, because some of them are paired, you have one occipital, one frontal, two parietal, two temporal, one sphenoid, and one ethmoid. So any other bones we talk about are not cranial bones, they're gonna be facial bones. So just kind of watch when you're taking the test, um, You'll see this on boards too. They kind of mix them up. But in the in the question, it might say cranial bone or it might say facial bone. So right away, when you see either cranial or facial, eliminate the ones that don't belong in that group. So if you memorize these eight or remember these eight cranial bones, the rest of them are gonna be facial bones. So if the question asks about cranial bones, cross out your facial bones or vice versa. Does anybody have any questions so far? Your zygomatic arch and your TMJ. So your zygomatic arch is formed by your zygomatic bone and your temporal bone. So you've got the temporal process of the zygomatic bone 
of the zygomatic bone means it's on the zygomatic bone and it's going toward the temporal bone. So it would be this little one right here. And then your your zygo or temporal process of the zygomatic bone. No, I said that backwards. Your zygomatic process of the temporal bone would be on the temporal bone and it would be heading toward the zygomatic bone. So you've got your zygomatic process of the temporal bone would be on the temporal bone heading toward the zygomatic. Your temporal process of the zygomatic means it's on the zygomatic heading toward the temporal. They meet in the middle. The temporal zygomatic suture is where they meet. We didn't memorize or study that suture, but if you were to ever see a question, say on boards or anything about that suture, this is the word right here, and it's very easy. Temporal zygomatic. It's where the temporal and zygomatic bones meet. Got them backwards. Meet right here. Any questions about those two bones? So whenever the one connects to the other, so like let's say the temporal bone connects to the zygomatic bone, you would say the temporal, how do you say that? Temporal <laughs> zygomatic suture. Oh, I was talking about when, not the suture, but like whenever they lay on one each other, like on each other and one says, or one is like the temporal process of the zygomatic bone. Yeah. So I was just wondering which one goes first whenever, like, if it's the zygomatic process, I guess. It doesn't, it doesn't matter which one you name first, if that, that's what, like, it doesn't matter if you say that. So of the bone, so like of the zygomatic bone means it's on the zygomatic bone. So if you're trying to describe this little area, this little process, if it's of the zygomatic bone and you're talking about this zygomatic bone and the process is the, um, remember the process is like an extension of bone. So the process or the extension would be toward the temporal bone, but it would be on the zygomatic. It would just be toward the temporal. So that's the temporal process of the zygomatic bone. On the flip side, if you're talking about the zygomatic process of the temporal bone, of the temporal bone means you're talking about the temporal bone. The zygomatic process, process being like a, an extension of the bone, goes toward the zygomatic. So you would be talking about the one going this way. Okay, thanks. And the zygomatic arch serves as the origin of the masseter muscle. So on the inferior view, so when you're trying to imagine like on that one question yesterday about the inferior view, if you um, inferior would be looking from the at the inferior side. So the inferior part of your skull would be down here. The superior would be up here. So if you're looking at the inferior, you're going to have the head tipped up like this. If you're looking from the superior view, you're going to be looking down in like inside the head from this angle. So most of the structures from the inferior aspect of the surface are more easily viewed on the skull model if the mandible is temporarily removed. OK, so we we did that when we were in anatomy class and then you can identify these different bones. And so um, when we get into our um, on ground session on Wednesday and we get out the skulls, we're going to rotate up to the inferior view and we're going to identify the um, structures we had talked about previously in class. So you've got your foramina. Foramina is a um, plural of foramen. So if you're talking about one, you're talking about a foramen. If you're talking about several, you're talking about foramina. So in this case, they're calling it foramina because we're going to talk about several different openings in the bone. So a foramen is an opening in the bone. It's the opening is so that different nerves, arteries, blood vessels um, can pass through the skull bones. 
Otherwise, the skull bones wouldn't allow anything in and out. So if you think like all of your nerves, your ne nerves, or they originate in the brain or they come off the brain. So as they come off the brain, they have to get to these other structures through these little holes. Otherwise, they'd be trapped inside the brain. So we usually start with the foramen ovale. So we looked at different ways to memorize the foramen, however, foramina. however you did that, that's up to you. Um, you can do it by doing it with the ROLS, like in that one video where he talked about rotundum, ovale, lacerum, spinosum, or you can locate the foramen ovale, which is the easy big one to locate and work to the lacerum, the spinosum and the rotundum from there. So we talked a lot about the styloid process. Make sure you know that this anytime you see sharp pointed projection, we're probably talking about the styloid process. It's it's sharp and pointy. The mastoid process, on the other hand, is more round or massive as some of you have said so the mastoid process is a little flatter and takes up more surface area than the styloid process but if you can locate the styloid process you can locate the mastoid process because it's it's just um, posterior to it and if you um, find both of them right between them is the stylomastoid foramen which we talked a lot about that one too, because of the seventh cranial or facial nerve exits from the skull to the face. So again, if you think of it, exits from the skull to the face. So the um, nerve starts out inside the skull on, from the brain and it works its way through the skull bones so that it can come out onto the face. So it's got to find an exit from inside that hard skull to get to these soft areas of the face. And so that's how it gets exits through the stylomastoid foramen right about back here. And then if you looked at the nerve, remember it comes up then like this and it runs up the face. So when you look at that model of the or that drawing of the facial nerve, when we look at chapter eight, if you trace it, it's going to start back here and it's going to work its way up the face. And that's because it's coming through the stylomastoid foramen right here. The rest of it's inside the skull as it comes off the brain. And it's going to send information back and forth through that nerve. So if you were to, um, you know, poke a pin in parts of your face, it's going to send that signal back to the brain. The jugular foramen is medial to the steroid styloid process and is more easily seen if the skull is tilted to one side. So you can kind of you kind of have to look to the side of the bone to see the jugular foramen. It's the opening through which the internal jugular vein and cranial nerves um, 9, 10, and 11, glossopharyngeal, vagus, and accessory nerves pass through. So there's a lot of activity going on through the jugular foramen. Passing through it, the internal jugular vein, and then also three cranial nerves, 9, 10, and 11. And again, so the nerves originate up in the brain. They have to pass through a foramen to get to where they need to be to innervate muscles Blood vessels need to get through to pass blood back and forth to these different areas of the face or the neck or the head, whatever we're talking about, the head. The largest opening on the inferior view is the foramen magnum of the occipital bone through which the spinal cord, vertebral arteries and the 11th cranial or accessory nerve pass through. So here's the spinal cord right here through this big hole, and the vertebral arteries. So the vertebral arteries supply blood to the vertebrae.
And then you've got the superior view. So now we've taken the skull from here and we've tipped it down and we're looking here. So the in that's called the superior view. So you're looking from the top. So um, you can see the frontal, ethmoid, sphenoid, temporal, occipital, and parietal bones from this view. And when we get in lab next week, we'll look at all of those bones. This, then the skull should be studied by looking at its individual bones and their various landmarks. So we're gonna do that. So, Prominences or depressions on a bony surface are, la are landmarks for the attachments of the mu associated muscles, tendons, and ligaments. So you have prominences, prominences like stick out, and then depressions go in. Um, the openings in the bone are also landmarks where various nerves and blood vessels enter or exit. And areas of the bone that are not prominence or depressions can also be demarcated. So we've got prominence, depressions, prominences stick out, depressions go in. And then we've got openings for the various nerves and blood vessels to enter or exit. A general term for any prominence on a bony surface is a process. So when we alveolar process, if you feel along your gums, don't do it now because you have to stick your fingers in your mouth, but if you feel along the roots of your teeth, it's bumpy. So you can feel the roots of your teeth. Those pro that's the alveolar process, the alveolar being the bone, and the process is where the bone covers the roots of the teeth, and it feels bumpy. You'll feel it more in some areas of your mouth than others, and you'll feel it more on some people than others. A general term, oh, we did that one. Um, one specific type of prominence located on the, a bony surface is a condyle, a relatively large convex prominence, usually involved in joints. So you've got your occipital condyles. They are kind of rounded bony structures that's where the um, vertebrae start on the occipital condyles. A rounded surface projecting from bone by a neck is a head. So you've got the condyle and you've got the head of the condyle. So you've got, think of just a head. It's suspended by a neck. A tuberosity is a large, often rough prominence. So we have a lot of different prominences or things that stick out. So if you think of a specific one, it will help you remember, like for the um, process, if you think of the condyles, um, if you think of the alveolar process, so you can remember that it sticks out. Um, often a large, often rough. Think of the maxillary tuberosity. I think probably in radiography, Professor Bowles has showed you what the maxillary tuberosity looks like on a radiograph or on a pano. Yes or no? Yes. Okay, so it's kind of porous looking and rough. Um, tuberosities are typically attachment areas for muscles or tendons. So your maxillary tuberosity would be a good example. So think of it as being porous and rough. An arch is shaped like a bridge with a bow-like outline. That's a pretty easy one. Phlegmatic arch, it's shaped like a bow. Then you have your depressions. So all of those are areas that stick out. Now we have depressions. One type of depression on a bony surface isn't and is a notch. We're just usually going to call, we're going to do notches. Those other words you're not going to see very often. So for example, the coronoid notch, the supraorbital notch. So a notch is a little depression on a bony surface. So if you're thinking of a notch, think of the coronoid notch. It's a little, you're, you're going along the smooth bone and there's a little indentation or depression. Same thing with your supraorbital. 
you're going along and you can feel a little arched up notch area. A sulcus or a sulci is another depression on a bony surface. So singular at sulcus, plural at sulci, which is a shallow depression or groove that usually marks the course of an artery or a nerve. So um, when you think of a sulcus, the first thing you usually think of probably is the area you're probing. So it would be a shallow depression. <clears throat> Notice how in um, 101 you probably learned you only call it a sulcus when it's shallow and healthy. Zero to three millimeters. That's your, your sulcus. When you get beyond that, it becomes a pocket. So we use the terms interchangeably um, as hygienists all the time. We say they have no pockets above three millimeters or their pockets are two to three millimeters. So we use it interchangeably all the time. But if you think of it from the science standpoint, the sulcus is the normal zero to three millimeters or your sulcus depth. Once it gets deeper than that, it's called a pocket. Is that how you learned it in 101? Anybody? Yeah, that is how we learned it. OK, the groove in the floor of the orbital surface is the infraorbital sulcus. That's a little bit. That's the example they're trying to give you on the bone. But think of more, like I said, along the terms of when you're probing, the sulcus is shallow. In this case, they're saying on a bony surface. The other place we talked about sulcuses in our in this class, sulci in this class, is on the tops or occlusal surfaces of teeth. So the central groove sits inside the sulcus. So there's a depression as it kind of slopes downward, and then the groove is in the middle. But that area is called the sulcus as it's angling from the occlusal surface down like that. That's your sulcus. And then your your groove runs down the center, um, kind of like a river bank. You know, the river bank slowly comes down like this, and then you've actually got the river that runs in the center, but the bank sort of slopes down first. Fossa, a generally deeper depression on a bony surface is a fossa. OK, um, fossa can be portions of joints, be attachment areas for muscles or have other functions such as your temporal fossa. This temporal fossa is an indentation or a depression and your temporalis muscle sits in the temporal fossa. Then we've got openings. A foramen is the one we know probably the most about is the foramen, the window-like opening. A canal is a longer, narrower, narrow tube-like opening in the bone. So when you think of a canal, there's usually going to be something running through it. It's going to be either a nerve or a blood vessel or a vein, but it's a hollow tube like, um, like a paper towel roll, and it's going to house things that pass through it. So the hypoglossal canal is where the hypoglossal nerve would run. It runs down the center of that tube. Meatus is a type of a canal. So your internal acoustic meatus is, is an opening or a type of a, a canal. A narrow cleft like opening in a bone is a fissure. So think of the fissure looking unique because it's like a slit. So it would be it's um, think of your superior and infra inferior orbital fissure. When you look inside the orbit, they made those two almost like a V like slit or like arrows pointing toward the nose. Those are your fissures. Fissures are long slender like slits. Um, articulation and sutures. An articulation is an area of the skeleton where the bones are joined to each other. 
So your um, main articulation you're going to think of where the, the bones are joined to each other is the TMJ. So you've got the mandible that comes up, you've got the temporal bone where they join, and they can be um, either movable or non-movable or immovable. In this case, it's movable. So all throughout the chapter three, they talked about bones articulating with each other, like the parietal bones articulating with each other at the sagittal suture. So the articulation in that case is not a movable joint. So do we want to take a short break here? Everybody want to? Okay, let's take a short break, refill our coffee cups. Everybody's still doing okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so let's come back at um, 8.50.
Is everybody ready to get started again? Yeah. yeah. All right. So muscles of facial development. So we're going to talk about muscles of facial development. The muscles of facial expression are paired muscles in the superficial fascia of the facial tissues. When they contact, the skin moves. Contract, I'm sorry, the skin moves. These muscles also cause wrinkles at the um, right angles to the muscles action line. The use of these muscles is noted during an extra oral exam. Studying your reflection in the mirror as you make various facial expressions is very helpful in learning about these muscles. So we're going to go through the muscles. And as we're going through the muscles, go ahead and try to move them. So all the muscles of facial expression originate from the surface of the skull bone and insert into the dermis of the skin. So origin and, origin and insertion of the muscles of facial expression is pretty easy to learn. They all originate from the surface of the skull bone, somewhere in the surface of the skull bone, and insert into the skin. The locations of the muscles of facial expression are varied. So the muscles may be further grouped into whether they are situated in the scalp, eye, or mouth region. So we talked about the muscles of facial expression. This picture, I believe, is the same one that's in your textbook. So some general terminology for rules. Let me see if it goes through this or if I can do, um, go through that. OK, um, so we're going to go through all of those. So I will talk to you. But the general um, rule of terminology for muscles of facial expression, um, they, if it says levator, levator, it levitates or lifts something. If it says depressor, it's going to pull something down. It's going to make it depressed. If it says um, oculi, it's the eye. If it says oris, it's around the mouth. So um, anguli would be the corners or the angles of the mouth. Labii would be the lips. And so if you're not sure, you can pretty much trace the muscle and see where it's going, where where it's headed to. So like right here, this depressor um, labii inferioris. So if it's superioris, it's going to be above. If it's inferioris, it's going to be below. So labii means lips. Inferioris means it's going to be below or under the lips. And depressor means it's going to pull it down. So that's kind of how you would break it up. If you're not really sure what some of these terms mean, if you see a group of muscle choices on a quiz or a test or on boards, start eliminating the ones you know it can't be. When we took the quiz for this particular chapter um, and on the midterm, some of you got like the levators and the depressors mixed up. So if I say it's going to raise the lip, it's going to be a levi levator. If I say it's going to lower the lip, it's going to be a depressor. If it ra raises the corners of the mouth, it's going to do something anguli. If it lowers the corners of the mouth, it's going to be something with anguli because we're talking about the angles or the corners of the mouth. Um, oculi, anything that has oculi is going to be the eye. If it says orbicularis, it's going to orbit or go around. So it's just kind of general terminology that you could use for process of elimination if you don't know the actual answer. All of the muscles of facial expression are innervated by the seventh cranial nerve or facial nerve, each nerve ser serving one side of the face. So the nerve comes off of the brain it passes through the hard skull, through the stylomastoid foramen back here, and then it's going to travel along the surface of the skin up into the facial area where it's going to innervate the muscles of facial expression. There's one on each side of the skull, so they come off the brain and they pass through the stylomastoid foramen on both sides and they continue to travel up the face 
and they innervate the side that they're on. Damage to the facial nerve results in facial paralysis of the muscles of facial expression on the involved side. Paralysis is the loss of voluntary muscle action. So if you have damage to the muscles, I mean to the nerves, it's going to result in no muscle movement. So you have your epicranial muscle, which is raises the eyebrows and scalp as when you show surprise. So everybody raise your scalp and show surprise. In the eye region, we have the orbicularis oculi muscle. So orbicularis means it orbits or goes around oculi the eye. So that's the orbicularis oris uh, um, circles the eye. It originates on the in orbital rim, the nasal process of the frontal bone and the frontal process of the maxilla. So um, I probably won't ask you where these originate. Most of the fibers insert in the skin tissue at the lateral region of the eye, although some of the inner fibers completely encircle the eye. The orbicularis oculi muscle closes the eyelid. If all the fibers are active, the eye can be squinted and wrinkles form in the lateral portion of the eye or crow's feet. So think of your lateral portions of your eyes. We all know where we talk about crow's feet and that's the lateral portions of your eye. Um, we didn't really study this one, but the corrugator su uh, supercilii muscle, corrugator supercilii muscle, is located deep to the superior portion of the orbicularis oculi muscle. We do not need to know this one. Then we're going to look at the mouth region. You have orbicularis oris. Again, orbicularis oris circles or orbits the orus or the mouth. This muscle acts to shape and control the size of the mouth opening and is important for creating the lip positions and movements during speech. So everybody, if you pucker your lips, that's your orbicularis oris muscle. Think of, um, when you think of the orbicularis oris, think of like sucking through a straw or um, people who smoke. You're going to kind of pierce your lips around something. It has four relatively distinct movements, a pressing together or closing the lips, a tightening and thinning or pursing the lips, a rolling inwards between the teeth as in grimacing, and a uh, thrusting outwards or pouting or kissing. So any kind of circular motion with the lips is going to be part of that. Your buccinator muscle is a muscle of facial expression. I know some people missed this on the midterm. Um, this will more than likely be on finals in some way, shape, or form because it is one that's commonly missed or forgotten. The buccinator muscle forms the anterior front portion of the cheek or the lateral wall of the oral cavity. So right here is your buccinator muscle. It originates from three areas, the, the alveolar process of the maxilla, the mandible, and from a fibrous structure, the pterygomandibular raphe. It pulls the angle of the mouth laterally and shortens the cheek both vertically and horizontally. This action keeps food pushed back on the occlusal surface of the teeth as when a person chews. So if you're not eating anything right now, if you're eating something, what, look in the mirror and watch yourself chew. If you're not eating anything, just make like a chewing motion and feel what muscles are moving or what your mouth is doing if you chew. So when you're chewing, your teeth are moving your jaw isn't just doing this. It's kind of moving in a more of a grinding motion almost. 
In infants, the muscle provides suction for sucking. Um, in addition, because of its importance in expelling air through pursed lips um, or wind instruments, it has been called the trumpet muscle. So same muscle if you were to take your mouth and fill it with air and blow out. The rosorius muscle originates from fascia superficial to the masseter muscle and passes anteriorly to insert in the skin tissue tissue at the angle of the mouth. So right here is your rosorius muscle. Think of your rosorius muscle as being very horizontal. So it's a very straight horizontal muscle. It acts to stretch the lips laterally. So again, if it's running straight horizontal, it's going to bring the lips straight back. Retracting the labial commissures and widening the oral cavity. So it's kind of like this, such as grinning or smiling or grimacing. It has a connection with the platysma in that it often contracts with it. So if you look at these two muscles, this rosorius muscle looks like it sits right on top of the platysma muscle. So we know which one is the platysma. It's this big, huge muscle that runs down like this. And if so, if an arrow is pointing to the one right above it, that's your rosorius muscle. Now you, these muscles, your levator and your depressors, again, levators are gonna lift, depressors are gonna pull it down. So your levator, labii superioris, superioris is gonna be above, labii the lip, so you're looking above the lip, and levator is going to raise. So the levator, labii superioris muscle is a broad, flat muscle of facial expression in the mouth region. And so right here, um, is follow this down is your levator labii superioris and if you look at that muscle it runs right down to the upper lip it elevates the upper lip or it levitates or lifts the upper lip the levator labii superioris elevates the upper lip and ala of the nose thus also dilating the nostrils as a sneezing expression I don't know how you're going to make that one, but you can make that one or practice on that one. Your zygomaticus major muscle, it passes anteriorly and inferiorly to insert in the skin tissue at the angle of the mouth. So it starts at the zygomatic arch and it travels down and forward. So anteriorly or forward and inferiorly, slightly down. So it's going to travel from here down to here. It elevates the angle of the upper lip and pulls it laterally as when a person smiles. So if we go back, you can see that it's going to attach to the angle of the mouth. And since it's going upward toward the zygomatic arch, it's going to pull the corners up. It would be really hard for it to pull them down since its attachment is up here. So kind of think of it that way. Some research suggests that the difference between a genuine smile and a perfunctory or lying smile is that when a person truly feels happy, the zygomatic major muscle contracts together with the orbicularis oculi muscle. So when they say contracts together, so if you're faking a smile, it's going to be when you're really genuinely smiling, it's more like that. So it contracts the eyes a little bit. And you all have probably seen that or done that before where you're looking at a picture and you can see somebody's like in a picture and they're smiling like this. So you can tell they're not really, they're forcing a smile as we would say. They're forcing themselves to smile. When they're truly smiling, their eyes squint up. The zygomaticus minor muscle, again, comes off the zygomatic arch. 
The muscle then inserts in the skin tissue of the upper lip adjacent to the insertion of the levator labii superioris. So they're kind of stacked. So you've got, oops, don't do that. Your levator labii superioris muscle is right there. Then you've got your zygomaticus minor right there. And your zygomat or your levator anguli. Zygomaticus minor muscle elevates the upper lip, assisting in the smile. So it helps to create the smile. And again, think of it as it comes off the zygomatic arch area. So it's not going to be doing anything down here. It's going to be pulling up this way. The level levator anguli oris, levator meaning lift, angle of the mouth, anguli, and oris being the mouth. It originates on the canine fossa of the maxilla. So we know the canine fossa is this little uh, depression or indentation just distal to the canine, the root of the canine tooth. Um, usually superior to the maxillary canine root, then it then passes inferiorly or down to insert in the skin tissues at the angle of the mouth. So it's going to be right here. And if you look at this picture, here's your levator anguli oris muscle. And again, it's going to lift or levitate the angles of the mouth. It elevates the angle of the mouth as when a person smiles. So all these muscles work together to form your smile. So you should appreciate your smile more. There's a lot of work going into it. Your depressor anguli oris, so depressing, depressor is gonna pull something down. So the depressor anguli oris is the triangular muscle of facial expression in the lower mouth region. It depresses the angle of the mouth as when a person frowns. And then your depressor labii inferioris, again, break down the words. Depressor, going to pull it down. Labii, the lip, inferioris, lower. It depresses the lower lip, exposing the mandibular anterior teeth. The mentalis muscle is a short, thick muscle of facial expression superior or above and medial, more inward, to the mental nerve in the mouth region. It raises the chin, causing the displayed lower lip to protrude and narrowing the oral vestibule. When active, these fibers may dislodge a complete denture in an edentulous patient who has lost the alveolar ridge height. We talked a little bit yesterday about you losing your alveolar ridge if you don't have teeth. The platysma, we know where that is. It's this big, thick muscle underneath. It raises the skin of the neck to form noticeable vertical and horizontal ridges and depressions. Your muscles of mastication. Same thing with muscles um, as we talked about with, um, is if it's memorize your muscles of, of mastication. There's only four of them. So when we're talking about muscles, if you see, if it says facial expression, eliminate the ones from mastication. If it says muscles of mastication, eliminate the facial expression one. If you memorize the four, masseter, temporalis, medial pterygoid, and lateral pterygoid. If it's not one of those four, it's a facial expression. So the muscles of mastication are responsible for closing the jaws, moving the lower jaw forward or backward, and shifting the lower jaw to one side or lateral deviate, lateral movement. So the jaw doesn't do a whole lot of different things. It opens and closes, it moves forward and backward, and it shifts from side to side. Can you repeat what those four are? There's the masseter, which is this big one here, the temporalis, which sits in the temporal fossa, the medial pterygoid, and the lateral pterygoid. So those are the ones that are inside.
that attach to the plate. The pterygoid. OK. So if you memorize those four, all the rest are muscles of facial expression. All the muscles of mastication are innervated by the mandibular division of the fifth cranial or trigeminal nerve. Fifth cranial, trigeminal, the cranial nerve five, those terms might be used interchangeably. The mandibular division is the one that splits into sensory and motor. The motor division is what moves the muscles of mastication. Motors make it move. The masseter muscle is this big one right here. The action of the muscle when there is bilateral contraction of the entire muscle is to elevate the mandible, raising the lower jaw. So basically when you're chewing, elevates the mandible. And if you notice when you're chewing, all of your action comes from your jaw, your mandible. So your rest of your head sits pretty stable in place. The chewing action comes from the movement of the mandible. So the masseter muscle sits in the sub masseteric space. When we talked about space, Boston spaces, that's the open space that it sits in. This, that part won't be on the test, but I can't promise you it won't be on board. So that's why I'm mentioning it. The temporalis muscle. The temporalis muscle sits in the temporal fossa. If the entire muscle contracts, the main action is to elevate the mandible, raising the lower jaw, so it assists in chewing as well or closing your mouth. When you have your hands on your patient's TMJ and you say open and close, that's what they're doing. The medial pterygoid muscle is deeper, so this, it's attached to the pterygoid plate, yet similar in form. So its origin is on the medial, medial surface of the lateral pterygoid plate of the sphenoid bone. So you've got your medial pterygoid plate, your lateral pterygoid plate, and its insertion, I mean, uh, sorry, its or, origin is on the medial surface of the lateral plate. So if you've got the plate sitting like this, you've got a lateral surface or farther from the midline, you've got a medial surface closer to the midline, and it sits on this medial surface. It elevates the mandible, raising the lower jaw. So again, it helps in chewing. The lateral pterygoid muscle lies within the infratemporal fossa deep to the temporalis muscle and has two heads. Um, the superior head originates from the inferior surface of the greater wing of the sphenoid bone. Um, the inferior head originates from the lateral surface of the lateral pterygoid. Don't memorize all those. The main thing to know is the um, is that the um, it lowers the jaw, depresses the mandible, so it helps to open the jaw. It also um, when they contract, they bring the lower jaw forward. So if you want to go like that. And it also um, moves it from side to side as in lateral deviation. So it kind of gives the ladder, the lateral pterygoid muscle kind of gives that ability to move your jaw in other directions besides opening and closing. Think of it kind of that way. And they are in the teromandibular space. So pain control, nerves, um, the management of pain through local anesthesia by dental professionals requires a thorough knowledge of the anatomy of the skull, trigeminal nerve, and related tissues. So this is part of or a big part of why this is so important to you. I'm not going to go over the review of the injections because you're going to have that whole course with Professor Ramos to do injections. Uh, 
uh, let's see. This is this is where they're showing you the greater and palatine um, nerve blocks. So as far as just knowing the nerves, so the posterior superior alveolar. Wait, let's back up a little bit here. So the, the trigeminal nerve divides into three different divisions. Division one is the ophthalmic division or V1. V1 goes up to the eye area. The second division is the maxillary division or V2. Um, try to think of V as in five. And V2 is the maxillary division and it's going to go up to the maxillary teeth. The third division, V3, is the mandibular. That's the V3 is the one that divides into sensory and motor. So you've got your sensory, which travels forward and innervates your teeth and your lower lip area and your chin, but you've got your motor that goes back and innervates the muscles of mastication. So all those muscles that we talked about, those four muscles that help you chew, bring your lower jaw up, assist in deviation from side to side, etc., all are innervated by the motor division. We need them to do something. So it's motor. The motor's going to make them move. The ones that go to your teeth are sensory. All that sensory does is cause a sensation. It gives you feeling. Other than that, that's just all that sensory is going to do. So we're going to look at the PSA or posterior superior alveolar. So as the maxillary division travels through or V2 travels through the foramen rotundum. So it originates in the skull. Or the brain, it's going to travel down and it's going to travel through the foramen rotundum as it enters into the maxilla. So it's got to come out of the hard skull somehow to get to the maxilla and innervate the teeth. And so it travels through the foramen rotundum to get to the maxilla where it is going to branch off into the PSA, MSA, and ASA. The PSA, posterior superior alveolar, okay? So posterior back, superior up. So it's going to be your molar teeth. Posterior, superior. The MSA, oh, I'm not going to show you how to do the injection, but the MSA, again, going to come off the maxillary division or V2, and it's going to drop down here the middle superior. So it's going to do the middle teeth. So it's going to do the premolar area. It's going to provide, when I say innervate, it's going to provide sensory feeling, sensation to those teeth. So when you have a toothache and you feel pain, those are the nerves that are innervating or feeling the pain. They are sending the brain, the signal to your brain. So if you have a premolar that hurts, that pain sensation is going to travel up the MSA and it's going to travel up to the maxillary division. It's going to travel through the trigeminal and up to the brain and it's going to tell the brain that you're having pain. The brain then is going to respond somehow to it. So that's the sent how it does sensory innervation. These um, nerves, as they enter these teeth, enter through the apical foramen of the tooth. So remember, you've got your root, and at your root tip, it's not completely closed. There's a foramen there, an opening in, in that area, and that's where the nerve's going to pass in and out of the tooth. That's also where the blood supply passes in and out. It so happens that the artery that supplies this is also the post or the this one would be the middle superior alveolar artery that provides blood supply to these teeth. So they kind of run together and they go inside the tooth and they provide for the tooth. Now 
not going to show you how to do that injection. Anterior superior alveolar, same thing. You're coming off the maxillary division or V2. It's going to branch off. So this one is going to travel to the infraorbital foramen right here with the infraorbital nerve. And off that is going to also be the anterior superior alveolar. So as we get to this end right here, this is going to branch to the um, in, infraorbital and also the ASA. So the ASA is going to provide sensory or feeling to your anterior teeth, your incisors, your canines, um, the gingiva, the periodontal ligaments, and the alveolar bone in that area. Same thing with these. They're also going to provide the gingiva, the periodontal ligament, and the alveolar bone. There is an injection where you can go in and you can come up really deep. So you'd be entering right about here. And you would go up with a long needle and you would try to catch this nerve right here and inject so that it will numb this whole area right here. So you can also, you can numb the anterior and the premolars all at once. We don't do that injection. It also numbs the lower part of their eye and that's part of the reason we don't. We do two separate injections. We do the MSA, which you're gonna enter right about here to catch the MSA. And then, I mean the ASA, and then we're gonna go right up here at the apex of the second premolar to get the MSA. Does that make sense? And that's just a picture of how you're gonna do that one. And I'm not gonna go into how to do, there's the infraorbital block though, where they're going in with that really deep needle. Greater palatine, so um, your greater palatine block is used during dental procedures that involve more than two maxillary posterior teeth or palatal soft tissue. This is how where you would locate the greater palatine foramen and you would inject. You're going to go in front of, so you know the greater palatine foramen is right there. You can see the little indentation. You're going to go in front of it because the anesthetic's going to run back because your head's tipped back. But we'll worry about those. Nasopalatine, the nasopalatine nerve comes down and innervates the palate of the anterior teeth. And that's how you would inject into that. As far as landmarks, we talked about this a little bit yesterday. So you have your, if you look at the bone, you've got your incisive foramen. That's where your nasopalatine nerve is going to come out and it's going to innervate from canine to canine on the palatal surface. So this darker area right here. But if you look inside a person's mouth, you don't see that. What you see is your incisive papilla. So that's going to be your landmark when you're looking in a patient's mouth is your incisive papilla. Just like when you look at the hard palate, Right here is your median palatine suture. Can you see that suture line right there? That's your median palatine suture. That's where the two bones come together. But when you're looking in a person's mouth, you don't see the two bones. You see the median palatine raphe. See that thicker tissue, that more callous looking tissue? That's the median palatine raphe. It covers the median palatine suture. Then you have your palatine rugae, which are all these little wrinkly things back here. But these two words sound very similar, so sometimes students get them mixed up. I try to avoid having both of them as a choice on a quiz or a test so that you don't get them mixed up. So the, there's difference between the bones or bony landmarks and the um, surface anatomy landmarks. These are the surface anatomy. What do you actually see? The bony landmarks are what lies underneath it. 
So mandibular, the V3 or division three of the trigeminal nerve is the one that branches into sensory and motor. Right now, when we're trying to anesthetize or talk about sensory innervation to the teeth, we're talking about the sensory portion of the nerve. It innervates the mandibular teeth. When I say innervates, it provides sensory innervation. So it gives your mandibular teeth feeling. If you put an ice cube in your mouth and one of your lower teeth, your lower first molar responds to the cold, that's going to be through your, the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve, the sensory route. Ouch, it's cold. It's gonna send a signal to your brain through that. So it's gonna come right here it's going to travel through the inferior alveolar nerve up to the mandibular branch right here, sensory division, and back to your brain from the trigeminal nerve. And it's going to tell your brain, ow, that hurts. The brain in response is going to tell, probably tell your tongue to push the ice cube off your tooth so it stops hurting. These, this is kind of a division or a tree that shows you all the different nerves that come off the mandibular nerve. So the mandibular nerve has all these branches coming off of it. The inferior alveolar is the big one. This is the one that innervates the nerves of your teeth. The lingual nerve also innervates the tissue on the lingual side of your um, tissue. We're not going to worry about the auricular temporal. It goes up. If you were to look at this word, auriculotemporal, auricular or auriculo is your ear, temporal is your temporal area. So it's going to probably run behind your ear, would be where you could easily guess. Your, um, oops. your buccal nerve is going to be the buccal side. It's going to be the gingiva and the tissue on the buccal side of your mandibular teeth. Your mylohyoid nerve is kind of a tricky one. Your mylohyoid nerve runs down and it goes down to your mylohyoid muscle. Sometimes when you're giving an IA, your mylohyoid nerve doesn't get anesthetized and your mylohyoid nerve will send some sensation of pain. And the patient will feel some pain when you're working on them. Don't really do anything differently on that. Sometimes you might just give an infiltration to kind of get that area numb. But that would be why sometimes people on a particular area don't get as numb. The, from the inferior alveolar, you've got these little branches that come off of it. The mental and the incisive. So this is an anterior view of your mandible with some landmarks on it. You've got your mental protuberance, which is basically your chin that sticks out. You've got your mental foramen, which is located approximately at the apex of your mandibular second premolar. Your mental nerve passes through your mental foramen. And then you've got the angle of your mandible, which is this bend right here. You've got your ramus, which is this flat bone right here. The body of the mandible is this bottom part right here, this thick bone right here. And your alveolar process of the mandible is the bone that covers the roots of your mandibular teeth. So your alveolar process sits superior to your body of your mandible, which is down here. Um, some other features on your mandible. We talked about the body, the mental foramen. We've got your ramus, your angle, the neck. The neck is this part right here. Then you've got the condyle. This is the one that articulates to form the TMJ, not this one. A lot of students get those two mixed up. This big thick one is the one that articulates, not this little one. 
This little one is called the coronoid process. And you're going to take your finger and you're going to follow the coronoid process down till right before you get to the mandibular molars where you have your coronoid notch. It's hard to feel, but it, remember a notch is a little indentation. So you're going to be feeling for a little indentation. And when you find that indentation, that's going to be your landmark, your bony landmark for your IA injection. This is your condyle, your mandibular condyle. The condyle is what articulates with the temporal bone to form the TMJ. The articulating surface is this top part. That's the part that actually articulates or moves with it. Um, we didn't really ever talk about your pterygoid fovea, but that one's on there. Your external oblique line. So you continue with your finger, you found your coronoid notch, and you continue anteriorly. And there's a, like a, a slight ridge right there. And that's your external oblique line. You have that very similar ridge on the inside called your internal oblique line or mylohyoid line. The internal and mylohyoid are used interchangeably. Does that make sense? Between your coronoid process and your condyle, you have this dip that's called your mandibular notch. I think that was in the game yesterday. All right. View, this is considered the lateral surface. It's the surface farther away from the midline. The midline would be right here in the middle of the body. The side is further away from the midline, so it's called the lateral surface. This is the medial surface. It's closer to the midline of the body. Here's the body, here's the midline. This is the medial surface. So right here is your mylohyoid line or internal oblique ridge, same thing. Then you've got your mandibular foramen right here. The ramus is this flat bone and again, we've got your articulating surface. Right above your mandibular foramen is this little bony projection called your lingula. Alveolar process is on both sides. It's the bone that houses the teeth, roots of the teeth. So you've got alveolar process on both sides because the bone is on both sides. Your retromolar triangle so your retromolar triangle sits just distal to the last molar in your mouth. It is covered by your retromolar pad. So the pad is just the tissue, the soft tissue. Think of the pad on the chair. The pad on the chair is just your soft tissue. The chair would be the, the metro, retromolar triangle. Um, you've got genial tubercles, which sit down here. You can see them on radiographs often. Your sublingual fossa, sublingual, is right here under the tongue, and your submandibular fossa sits behind it and down lower on the mandible. It sits right below your mylohyoid line back here. So you can see there's your mylohyoid line. It forms like a ridge, and there's your submandibular fossa. So on your inferior alveolar block, I'm not going to show you how to or talk about how to do the block, but if you follow your inferior alveolar nerve right here, down. Somebody have a question? Okay. If you trace with your finger or with your cursor down the inferior alveolar nerve, it's going to continue to travel. This is where it's innervating the teeth. The nerve innervation, again, is going through the apical foramen. And that's how it's getting inside the teeth. And it's giving sensory innervation only. Think about it. Your teeth don't really move separately of their, of, by themselves. So it's giving you sensory innervation to your teeth. It's going to sense sweet or hot or cold. Proprioception. 
And then as you come get to the mental foramen, it's going to split into the mental and incisive. So right here. So the incisive nerve is still going to go up to the teeth and innervate the anterior teeth. The mental nerve is going to come out through the mental foramen and it's going to innervate your chin and this area down here. So when you are studying, I want you to go back to this picture. This picture's in your book, this picture's on your PowerPoints, it's all over the place. And literally trace this with your finger and really look at where are these little nerves going? Because you'll see the incisive comes up to the teeth, the mental comes out to the chin area through the mental foramen. When you're doing a mental or mental incisive injection, you're going to come straight down and you're going to plant your needle right about here, just in front of and above the foramen because the head is tipped back when they're laying in the chair. If you want to just numb the buccal gingiva and this area right here, you can just do the mental. If you want to also numb the teeth, which is most of the time what you're doing, you're going to want to also numb this incisive nerve. And so you'll take your finger after you deposit your anesthetic right here and you'll put pressure on it and you will push that anesthetic back through the foramen so that it hits this nerve right here so that the teeth get numb. That incisive nerve is what is providing sensory innervation to those mandibular anterior teeth. So when you give an IA, it will get that too. But sometimes that wears off because these teeth are, when you give anesthetic, it travels down and it innervates as it's going or anesthetizes as it's going. And so sometimes, and then it unanesthetizes going the opposite direction. So these will come, become unnumbed first. Here's your IA. I have, a, I have question. a question. Sure. So, well, for oh, this for final, that. we need to know about like numbing and different stuff like that. You will not need to know numbing per se, because we're going to we're actually studying it kind of backwards. It makes more sense when you think of numbing. But if it numbs something, you're numbing the area that's being innervated. You will need to know innervations. So when I say the incisive nerve gives sensory innervation to the low, the mandibular anterior teeth, I was just saying you're going to numb those. Think about what gives it um, innervation though. So when a patient tells you you're doing scaling and replating and you're on the anterior mandibular anterior teeth and the patient says, ow, that hurts, I can feel that. What your brain is going to then be doing is going, what nerve innervates those teeth? Because that's the nerve I want to anesthetize. See how that, like, they kind of feed off each other? Yes. I, won't ask, I won't ask you on this test, like, where, it, where are you injecting and all that kind of stuff. I'm just showing you that. So you get a feeling for the mental nerve comes through the mental foramen. The incisive nerve does not. It stays there. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay. The buccal nerve. So the buccal nerve is going to um, innervate the buccal periodontium of the mandibular molars and the buccal, um, just the buccal tissue. So the buccal nerve is just going to strictly do buccal. It's not going to, it doesn't provide any sensory innervation to your teeth. It just does the buccal part or the cheek area. And we'll skip that, skip that. You'll know where your mental frame is. I'm sure you've already located that in radiography. We're not going to talk about these nerve blocks. Your ear, your external ear, 
These are the parts to your ear. Your external acoustic meatus is the most important. It's the hole that goes through the ear into the skull. It also goes through the skull. Your tragus is this little flap behind it. Your antitragus is this tissue on the other side, and your intertragic notch, notch is that little dip down that you can feel with your finger. And then you've got your earlobe or your lobule. And then your helix is this whole outer part of your ear. Salivary glands. So the main things to learn about salivary glands um, is if they don't work, you can experience something called xerostomia or dry mouth. Lots and lots of medications cause xerostomia or dry mouth. And many patients take a combination of drugs that cause it. So um, they use the extreme of radiation treatment, and chemo and all that. But on a much more common and lesser note that you're gonna notice is patients that take blood pressure medicine. Patients that take antihistamines. Um, let's see what else cause any any antidepressants will usually cause dry mouth. So you might get a patient that takes high blood pressure medicine and has allergies. And those two medications they take are going to cumulatively cause dry mouth for them. So um, you, when you get in farm, you'll learn all the mechanisms of action. But know that your salivary glands that secrete your saliva play an important role. They start out with the digestion of, or the beginning process of the digestion of your food. So your salivary glands secrete saliva that contain enzymes that start the breakdown of your food. They also help provide lubrication so your food slides down easily. Patients who have severe dry mouth have a harder time swallowing food. It makes eating far less pleasant. Your major salivary glands, you have three of them. Your parotid, which is the big E right here. Your submandibular, which are down here. And your sublingual, which is under your tongue. So inside under your tongue. Of your major salivary glands, um, they are paired, so there's one on each side. Here's a picture, here's your parotid gland, here's your uh, submandibular, and here's your sublingual. They have ducts. They all have ducts associated with them. So you can see like your parotid gland, it travels through this duct and opens up just beside your maxillary second molar. Both your submandibular and sublingual have ducts that travel and they op both open up at the sublingual caruncle or those two little dots that are underneath your tongue. Um, your parotid gland is the largest in size. It's encapsulated, so it's in a hole. It's rounded, it's, um, it's got a, an outer. Um, but it is not your major producer of saliva. So it's the biggest in size because look at all the space it takes, but it is not the biggest by volume. It has a duct and it is associated with the Stenson's duct. So the parotid gland, Stenson's duct. Parotid gland, largest, um, but not in size, but not volume. Stenson's duct. It opens opposite of the maxillary second molar. We're not going to talk about the mumps. People don't get the mumps anymore. The submandibular gland um, is the second largest. It's encapsulated, meaning it's kind of enclosed. It's the second largest in size, but the largest in volume. 60 to 65%, so it's your biggest volume secretor. It is associated with the Wharton's duct. So Wharton's duct goes with the submandibular salivary gland. 
So when you're memorizing submandibular gland, second largest in size, largest by volume. Associated with the submin, uh, sorry, associated with the Wharton's duct, and the duct opens up at the sublingual caruncle or under the tongue. And there's a picture of the sublingual caruncle under the tongue. There are these two little dots right here. So the submandibular salivary gland sits in the submandibular fossa right here. Your sublingual salivary gland is the smallest of your major salivary glands and it's unencapsulated. It only provides 10% by volume. It's associated with the Bartholin duct. So the sublingual, smallest in size, unencapsulated, associated with the Bartholin duct, and it also opens under your tongue at the sublingual caruncle. in the sublingual fossa. So underneath the tongue right up here. I have a question. Okay. Did you say that the submandibular was capsulated? Yes. Okay, thank you. So parotid and submandibular are encapsulated. Sublingual is not. I apologize. My neighbors are like doing all their lawn work today. So it's kind of loud back here. I've walked around the house when we were on break to see if there was a quieter room, but if there isn't, it's all loud. So I apologize. Your minor salivary glands. You have lots of minor salivary glands. Um, they're located all over the mouth. They don't have specific names because there's so many of them. Then you have your thyroid gland. Um, your thyroid gland is located in your neck area. It's right below your hyoid bone. So if you look at this picture, here's your hyoid bone, which sits suspended in your neck. And there's your thyroid cartilage right there. Um, it's butterfly shaped. So you can kind of see that it's butterfly shaped right there. Um, it controls metabolism. So you've probably, we don't need to know all this thyroxine stuff. You'll learn that in pharmacology but in, and in nutrition. But it controls metabolism. You've heard of people having like thyroid problems and they gain weight. They have hypothyroidism. So they don't have enough secretion and they gain weight. Or they have hyperthyroidism and so they lose weight because their thyroid, their metabolism is really high. So your thyroid gland regulates or controls your metabolism. So if you're at a nice balance, then you should be balancing your weight and your metabolism. If either end is not working properly, you're going to have weight loss or weight gain. There are lots and lots of patients that take medication for thyroid. So you will learn a lot about thyroid medications in pharma. I'm not going to go through all this now. This is kind of more like a board review. So by the time we're doing this PowerPoint, you should have learned all this. So I'm just kind of skipping over some of these things. So this is a summary of the glands. This is, which gland is this? Number one. Anybody want to take a guess? This Parotid. is your par parotid. This one is? Mandibular. Submandibular, because it's below the mandible. Sub or below. This one is the sublingual. It's below the tongue or lingual tongue. This one sits in the sublingual space. This one sits in the submandibular space. Okay. Tooth identification. We're going to talk a little bit about teeth. Um, universal numbering system, 1 through 32. Universal numbering system for primary, A through T. 
as far as the parts of the tooth, you have your enamel. Your enamel covers your anatomic crown. Your anatomic crown is the actual crown of the tooth that's covered with enamel. Your clinical crown is the part of the tooth that you see in the mouth. So if you have recession, your clinical crown is going to include some of your root. Your anatomic root is the part of your root that's covered with cementum. So anatomic, think of it as what you're born with. What's, what stays where it is. Your clinical is what changes, what do you see? Your clinical crown can become, include part of your root if you have recession. You've got underneath your enamel and your cementum, you have dentin. So dentin is the biggest one in your mouth because it covers the underneath of both your crown and your roots. The inner side here, very innermost part is your pulp chamber. Your pulp contains your nerves and your blood supply to your tooth. It comes through the apical foramen. So you notice on this tooth, the root is not completely closed. There's a little hole there, and that's what allows for passage for your arteries and for your nerves to come into the tooth. That is where you have your sensations in your tooth. That's where you have what we call vitality or life because that's where your blood and nerves and all that. If you feel pain or if you um, are sensitive to cold or hot or sweet, that sensation is coming from the pulp, from the nerve that's inside the tooth. Uh, let's see. We know probably by now anterior teeth and posterior teeth, buccal and lingual in all the directions, mesial, distal. You should know that really well by now from scaling teeth. Um, let's see. Crown to root ratio. The smaller the crown to root ratio, that means the e more equal the crown and the root are in length. So this one would have a lower crown to root ratio than this one because there's a bigger difference between the sizes of this root and crown. So think of larger crown and root ratio because the lar there's a larger difference in the two numbers. Closer, smaller.